Probably the most valuable thing that can be in every person is honesty. I'll be honest. Sometimes I can lie somewhere, but it doesn't go that far. When I got married, my beautiful wife and I had two equally beautiful children. And everything would have seemed fine until I found out the two children are not my children at all. And the worst thing is, each of them has different fathers. It has been suggested that there exists a delicate balance between love and hate. I once came across an online post stating that human emotions can easily shift from one extreme to another, and perhaps there is truth in that. There was a time when I deeply loved my wife and would have willingly taken a bullet for her. Now it takes all my strength to resist the urge to harm her cunning eyes. I go by the name Abraham Ryan, or Abe, among friends. I had an average academic record in high school, dabbled in sports, and graduated in 2001. The following day, I enlisted in the Army, spending four years as an artilleryman and completing a tour in Afghanistan before receiving an honorable discharge. I pursued some college courses during my service and used the benefits to obtain a degree in computers and electronics. It was during this time that I crossed paths with Kirsten. After several months of dating, we fell in love, and I felt overjoyed when she accepted my Mariag proposal. However, there was a complication. Kirsten's father, Bart Robertson, a prosperous CEO of a major accounting firm in our area, was skeptical of me, concerned that I might have ulterior motives regarding Kirsten's trust fund he insisted on a prenuptial agreement to safeguard her assets. I was unaware of her financial situation and had no knowledge of her family's wealth. However, I agreed to the marriage after consulting with an attorney who happened to be a close friend of my father. The agreement was standard, with one notable clause addressing adultery. According to the terms, in the event of a divorce based on adultery, the guilty party would receive no financial support and would leave the marriage with only their initial contributions. I wasn't concerned, as I was committed to Kirsten and had no intentions of being unfaithful. I understood that Kirsten's father was apprehensive about the possibility of me cheating on his daughter and attempting to take advantage of her substantial trust fund, a concern I later became aware of. Following college, Kirsten joined her father's company, starting from the bottom like any other recent business graduate. It seemed there were no special privileges for the boss's daughter. I transitioned to full-time employment with the service company that initially hired me part-time during my final two years of college. In this role as a field service representative, I was responsible for troubleshooting and repairing computers, servers, and networks. The job was rewarding, offered a competitive salary, and provided excellent benefits. Together, Kirsten and I were doing quite well. Fortunately, my work didn't require frequent travel, with occasional trips every few months for training seminars on the latest technology. Kirsten would spend several nights at her parents' place, supposedly working on a project for her father. Initially, our marriage was thriving. Both of us enjoyed our fulfilling jobs, and we were able to make a down payment on a lovely three-bedroom starter home. I surprised Bart by declining his offer to cover the down payment. Thanks, but no thanks, I told him. I've been saving up for this for a long time, and I believe Kirsten and I should accomplish this on our own. While this was true, I also knew he harbored resentment towards me, and I wanted to avoid giving him any leverage over us. Before our relationship took a turn for the worse, I envisioned a lifelong partnership. Kirsten never raised any red flags, and our intimate life was fantastic. We frequently enjoyed dinners and dancing, often concluding the night with a celebration in bed. Kirsten and I frequently attended the various corporate events hosted by her father. Despite feeling somewhat out of place, Kirsten would always stay close to ensure my comfort. Her father would enthusiastically highlight his daughter's professional achievements, introducing her to everyone he could. As an afterthought, he might acknowledge me as her husband, but never mentioned me by name. Little did he know that the company I worked for had installed all the servers in his company and held an ongoing contract for various network and IT services. 
After a year on the job, I became a key contact for the contractors collaborating with his company's tech department. This connection led me to visit occasionally to oversee things, allowing me to build relationships with several people at Kirsten's workplace, which would prove useful later on. Our first child, John, arrived almost a year into our marriage. I'll always remember my mother's reaction. While she expressed joy that the child was healthy, a subtle frown appeared as she scrutinized him. Though she didn't voice her concerns, I stored this observation in the back of my mind. Over a year later, our daughter, Kelsey, was born. Kirsten faced difficulties during delivery and opted for a Tubal ligation. We had discussed this decision beforehand, agreeing that we had contributed enough to the continuation of the human race. My mother's reaction mirrored her response to John's birth. It took several months before my mother expressed her worries to me. Abe, I hope I'm completely mistaken, but I'm not entirely convinced that the children are yours, she confessed. What? I inquired. Call it a mother's intuition, but I truly believe it's necessary to have the kids undergo testing just to be sure, she suggested. Trusting my mother and aware that she wouldn't bring up such concerns without a valid reason, I decided to seriously consider her advice. Kirsten and I easily adapted to the married with children lifestyle, and life in the Ryan household was delightful. When people asked how we were doing, we would say, living the dream. I temporarily set aside my mother's worries, convinced that Kirsten wouldn't betray our relationship, right? Everything was going smoothly until around four or five months ago. That's when Kirsten informed me that her father had brought in a manager from New York and was considering appointing her as his personal assistant, or PA. According to Kirsten, this would entail working longer hours and possibly traveling to meet clients across the country or even globally. Curious about the potential impact, I asked her one night, how often would you have to travel? I don't know, maybe a couple of times a month, she replied. And for how long? I inquired. She shrugged. Not certain. The previous manager in that role would sometimes be away for as long as a week or even more. A week? I exclaimed. Or more? That's going to be challenging for the kids, not to mention us. Don't worry, she reassured me. I'm just one of three people being considered. I doubt I'll get the job. But if I do, it would mean a significant increase in salary for me which translates to more savings for retirement and the kids' college fund. We have some time to adapt, though. They won't be making any final decisions for a couple of months. Meanwhile, I'll be spending extra time with my dad until the decision is made. I wasn't thrilled with the news, and I wasn't convinced that we needed the extra money. However, I knew better than to disrupt the situation without gathering more information. My military experience had taught me the importance of obtaining reliable intelligence before taking action, so that's the approach I decided to take. A couple of days later, I found myself at Kirsten's company conducting a routine check on the server room. Everything appeared to be in order, so I seized the opportunity to gather information about the new manager. I spoke with several individuals in the vicinity and conducted some research on my own discovering that the new manager went by the name of Jake Riley. Jake had recently relocated from New York, where he held a similar position with a sizable Wall Street firm. This raised a concern for me. Why would he leave New York to come to the Midwest? Surely he could have commanded a higher salary there than here. Additionally, I learned that he was married with a child, yet, for some reason, they opted to remain in New York. Another cause for concern. I made a mental note to consider seeking professional assistance from an investigator, and I already had the perfect person in mind. I was acquainted with him as Uncle Sam. No, not the iconic Uncle Sam. He happened to be my father's brother, and his given name was Samuel Ryan. Do you suspect this guy might be trying to deceive you with Kirsten? He inquired. Yeah, there's something about him that raises my suspicions, I replied. Supposedly, he left his family, including a wife and child, in New York after recently departing a prominent Wall Street firm. 
Why would he abandon his family to come here? Well, it might be nothing, but then again, who knows? I'll investigate and see what I can discover, okay? And don't worry about the bill, he assured. Just pitch in for the expenses, all right? I can't impose on you like that, Uncle Sam, I objected. He dismissed my concern. Let it go, he insisted. This is family, and that's more important. Maybe you can help me set up a new server or something. Sam reached out to me a week or so later. You were right, he confirmed. Old Jake Riley has quite a reputation as a womanizer. That's why he left New York. It appears he had an affair with the wrong woman and faced significant trouble with his firm. They gave him the choice to either leave quietly or be terminated. He is legally married and has a child, a boy. He's currently separated from his wife, who is seeking a divorce. According to my findings, she's living in a rundown trailer in Albany. Figures, I remarked. There's one more thing, Sam disclosed. I conducted an extensive search and discovered that Riley and Kirsten's father have a lengthy history. Jake initially worked with old Bart Robertson and moved to New York about three years ago, coinciding with his marriage. Three years ago? I inquired. Do you know if Jake and Kirsten knew each other back then? It's quite possible, Sam said. They both worked for the same company and Jake was known to visit the Robertson household frequently. It struck me as unusual. Jake was never brought up or mentioned before this all began. I remembered several evenings when Kirsten would head to her parents' house, claiming to be engrossed in a project. I also recalled the times she spent the night, insisting it was a crucial project for the company. There's another piece to this puzzle, Sam revealed. I conducted a thorough background check on him and found his birth certificate. Care to guess who is listed as his father? I have no idea, I replied. Bartholomew Robertson, he stated. What? I exclaimed. You mean Kirsten's father? There could be another Bartholomew Robertson, but it certainly seems that way, he said. I felt a sinking sensation about all this, but kept my thoughts to myself until I gathered more information. Do you want me to initiate a comprehensive investigation? Sam inquired. Yeah, I affirmed, and I'll compensate you for your efforts. I phoned Mabel, Kirsten's mother, and inquired about the possibility of visiting. Mabel and I had always had a good relationship, and I held her in high regard. Of course, she replied. Bart's currently not here, but you can reach him at his office. I'm not interested in talking to Bart, I responded. However, I do have a significant favor to ask you. All right, she agreed. I grabbed a couple of baggies, drove to their mansion, and met her at the entrance. What's going on, Abe? She inquired. Something seems amiss. I can sense it. Yes, there is, I admitted. Tell me, Mabel, does Jake stay overnight here? Yes, Mabel confirmed. He's staying until his condo is ready. Why do you ask? I explained my concerns, and Mabel directed me to the suite where Jake slept. Since it had its own bathroom, I quickly obtained what I needed, a couple of hairs with the follicle attached. I placed them in one baggie and labeled it Jake. By the way, Mabel, I added, does Kirsten spend time with Jake here? Well, they've known each other for a while, so I assume they do. Do you think they're involved romantically? She inquired. I don't know, but I plan to find out. One more thing, Mabel, I continued. How close is Bart to Kirsten? They've always been very close, she revealed. She's somewhat of a daddy's girl and always has been. Why do you ask? I need to confirm something, I explained. Can you show me where Bart showers? Sure, Mabel agreed. Follow me. We entered Bart's dressing area, and I discovered a couple more hairs with the follicle attached. Bingo. I bagged them and labeled the bag Bart. What's happening? Mabel pressed. Really? Mabel, I don't want to say anything until I have evidence. I'll update you on what I discover, and please, don't share this with anyone. I won't, Abe, she assured. Just be extremely cautious. Bart can be quite vindictive. 
I followed my mother's advice and decided to conduct a DNA test on the children, including samples from myself, Bart, and Jake. Spending the entire $500, I received the results within two days. Shockingly, the test revealed that neither of the children was biologically mine. Jake turned out to be John's father, while Bart was Kelsey's father. Additionally, the test confirmed that Bart was Jake's father, implying an unsettling level of incest. Not only did Kirsten betray our marriage by cheating, but she also violated the prenuptial agreement. Enraged by this revelation, I happened to be at Kirsten's workplace that afternoon when Nancy Albertson, Bart's secretary, approached me. Mr. Ryan, she said. Mr. Robertson would like to see you. Equipped with my digital recorder for meetings, I activated it, placed it in my pocket, and followed her to a conference room on a higher floor. Upon entering, I faced Bart, a recognizable superior court judge, several executives, Jake, and a person I presumed to be Bart's attorney. Two of Bart's security personnel stood on either side of me. Bart invited me to take a seat and I noticed a glass of what seemed like whiskey already placed at my designated spot on the table. Please, Bart urged, join me in a drink, will you? Politely declining, I explained, No, thank you. I'm still on the clock, and I only drink with family and friends. I'll stand if you don't mind. My response garnered smiles from the room, as it was unusual for anyone to speak so assertively to Bart Robertson. His tone shifted as he unfolded a paper and placed it in front of me. Have it your way, Ryan, he said. Concerned, I inquired. Look, if there's an issue with billing, you can take it up with our accounts receivable. I don't handle billing. Bart dismissed the notion, stating, This has nothing to do with billing. Okay, I replied. So what is this? Bart insisted. I want you to sign this right now. You don't need to read it. Just sign it so the judge here can put his signature on it and make it official. Curious, I inquired. What is it? Call it a postnuptial agreement that precedes the prenuptial you signed earlier, Bart replied. Just sign it and we'll be done. I pressed further. Has Kirsten signed this? Yes, she has, Bart confirmed. Interesting she never discussed it with me, I remarked placing the folded document in my briefcase without looking at it. She doesn't need to discuss it with you, Bart asserted. I'll have my attorney look it over, and if he agrees that it's in my best interest, I'll sign. And not before, I declared. I didn't actually have an attorney, but Bart was unaware of that fact. His face turned red as he jumped out of his chair. God damn it, boy, he growled. You will sign this paper right fucking now. Or what? I challenged. You'll have your goons beat me in front of your executives and a superior court judge, or maybe have one of them put a bullet in my head. You'd better sign it, or it won't go well with you, boy, he warned. I looked at the judge, who seemed to have an amused look on his face. Tell me, Your Honor, is it just me, or does that sound like a threat? I asked. The judge nodded his head. I suppose it certainly could be seen as a threat, he admitted. He turned to Bart. Let him consult with his attorney, Bart. Once he sees that it's all legal and in his best interest, he'll sign. Bart settled back into his seat. By the way, Your Honor, I said, is incest still a felony in this state? I saw nervous glances around the room and I thought Bart was going to explode. The judge sat up before answering. Well, yes, it is. But I don't know of anyone who's actually been convicted of that. Why? he asked. Just asking for a friend, I said, looking at Bart. Just sign the goddamn paperwork, he said, taking a swig from his drink. I left the building, wondering what was going through the rumor mill. I called Sam to get a recommendation for a good lawyer. He referred me to his friend, Frederick Marsh. I called and got an appointment to see him the next morning. The following morning, I presented my case and shared the test results with him. I also showed him the post-nuptial agreement Bart had handed me. After taking the time to read it the previous night, I was furious. 
it was hard for me to believe that Kirsten would betray me in this way. Fred, as he preferred to be addressed, examined the agreement Bart had provided. Have you looked at this? he inquired. Yes, I have, I replied. Unless I've lost my mind, it states that I agree to willingly accept the role of a cuckold and forfeit my rights as a husband. You're not losing your mind, he assured me. It clearly states that you consent to your wife engaging in extramarital affairs, relinquishing any rights to consummate your relationship. Additionally, you're obligated to provide financial and parental support for the two children, whom we now know aren't biologically yours. The only compensation mentioned is a $1,000 monthly stipend for their support. Other than that, you'd be in a precarious situation. It also stipulates that you would surrender 80% of your salary and retirement in the event of a divorce. You'd be required to pay alimony and child support. In essence, you'd be reduced to nothing more than a live-in caretaker for the children. That can't be legal, I protested. While it's not entirely illegal, it's undeniably outrageous. I can't imagine any court endorsing this. Plus, you'd have to be deemed mentally unfit to agree to such terms, he remarked. What about their incestuous relationship? I inquired. Fred confirmed to me that engaging in incest between adults in this state is considered a felony, carrying a potential punishment of up to 25 years in prison. Despite my reluctance to raise two young children who were not biologically mine and my hesitation to bear any financial responsibilities, I cherished the kids and desired to maintain a presence in their lives. My sole objective was to terminate this fraudulent marriage. Fred assured me that he would prepare the necessary divorce paperwork, citing adultery as grounds, leveraging the prenuptial agreement. Given the circumstances, Fred suggested that I pursue custody and let Kirsten fight for them if she truly wanted to. We agreed to postpone the legal proceedings until we knew whether Kirsten secured the new job. The atmosphere at home grew chilly in the following weeks. Kirsten reacted strongly when I brought up the post-nuptial agreement. What is this? I questioned her. Do you really expect me to agree to something like this? It's not a big deal, she replied. It's just something my dad wants you to sign. Did you read it before signing? I inquired. Of course I did, she affirmed. So you want me to endure a loveless, sexless marriage while you pursue other relationships? Meanwhile, I'm expected to take care of your kids. This can't be serious, I retorted. I am serious, Abe, she insisted. I love my job, and I won't quit. I love you, and you'll be provided for. So why does it matter? Provided for? I questioned. I don't want to be taken care of. I want my wife back. I want a family of my own. I won't be trapped in a sexless marriage, serving as nothing more than your live-in nanny. I tore up the paperwork and tossed the shreds on the floor. Return that to your dad and let him know he can kiss my ass. Kirsten, I inquired, can you share with me how long you've been connected with Jake? Her eyes widened. I, I'm not sure what you're getting at, she responded. We knew each other in college, but that's all. Really? I questioned. I find that hard to believe. Heading upstairs, I retrieved her clothes from the closet and relocated them to the guest bedroom. What's going on? She asked. Since I no longer have a wife committed to fidelity, I explained, I'm asking you to leave my bedroom. I encountered Kirsten infrequently over the following two weeks. She mostly stayed at her parents' house, likely involved with Jake. Sam managed to capture photo and video evidence of their intimate encounters at a motel on the outskirts of town. I reviewed the evidence before passing it on to Fred. Just think, Jake told Kirsten, soon we'll be able to do this as much as we want. And when your dad joins us in New York, we'll have a great time. Kirsten smiled. Yes, and I don't even have to worry about getting pregnant with you guys again, she said. Jake laughed. It was around this time that Bart appeared on the video. Kirsten kissed him hard. It's a pity that your husband has to be so stubborn. He really should have agreed to the deal I offered him, he said. However, 
Everything is fine. Once we're in New York, they'll be taken care of forever. Jake and I will arrange everything exactly the way you want, honey. Abe, the children and his parents will suddenly go missing. Abe's house and his parents' house will mysteriously burn down after they are all shot. Their bodies will be cremated and scattered throughout the countryside. No one will find them. We'll declare them dead, and then you'll have Abe's insurance, home insurance, and no problems with the kids. Until then, we will lie low and give them no reason to suspect us. What about Mom? Kirsten asked. What's wrong with her? She's too scared and stupid to do anything about it. Don't worry about her, dear, Bart said. Kirsten smiled. I can't wait, she said, caressing her father's manhood. Now take me. By this point, I was boiling with anger. Not only had my supposedly loving wife betrayed me with her father and her boyfriend half-brother, but they were also conspiring to have us killed. Fred assured me that the authorities had been notified and actions were underway to bring them all to justice. Finally, Kirsten dropped by the house briefly to share her news. I got the job, she announced, smiling. Congratulations, I responded, attempting to wear a cheerful expression. She embraced me and gave me a kiss. Don't worry, darling, she reassured. I won't let the job affect us, I promise. By the way, Dad is hosting a party to formally introduce Jake to the company and announce my promotion. And yes, you're invited. Even though he's not pleased, you declined to sign his agreement. When is the party? I inquired. Tomorrow night, she informed me. So make sure your suit is clean, okay? Once again, I contacted Fred to update him on the situation, and he assured me that law enforcement officers would be present at the event. After dressing up, we headed to the party after leaving the kids at my parents' house. I opted for my usual suit for such occasions, while Kirsten wore a knee-length dress that highlighted her curves tastefully. Even in worn-out blue jeans, she would still look incredibly appealing. Make sure to behave yourself, she reminded me before entering the venue. Inside, people were engaged in small talk. Kirsten went to greet her father and Jake. Care to buy a drink for an old lady? I turned to find Kirsten's mother, Mabel. We went to the bar and I ordered a beer for myself and a cocktail for her. Abe, you're a decent man, she acknowledged. I'm truly sorry for everything. Why does your husband harbor such resentment against me? I inquired. It's simple she explained. You're too blue-collar for his taste. You carve your own path, succeed independently without relying on others to do the dirty work. Plus, being a veteran doesn't sit well with him. The military rejected him when he was younger, and he always wanted Kirsten to marry someone already well-established, like Jake. Does he know that Jake already has a wife and child in New York? I questioned. Mabel's eyes widened in surprise. I don't know, she admitted. I had no idea about that. And I've learned that Jake worked with Bart a few years ago before moving to New York. Is that correct? I probed further. Mabel's face paled slightly. Yes, they've known each other for a long time. I see, especially since Bart is Jake's biological father, as indicated by his birth certificate and a DNA test. Were you unaware of this? I revealed. Mabel's eyes widened in shock. What are you saying? She asked. That's right, I confirmed. I possess Jake's birth certificate and a DNA test that proves Bart is his biological father. You weren't aware of this? She shook her head. I had a suspicion that he was unfaithful, but I never found any evidence, she stated. There's more to it, I replied. Neither of the kids is mine. Are you sure? She inquired. DNA doesn't deceive, I asserted. Jake is John's father and... And what? Mabel pressed. Bart is Kelsey's biological father, I disclosed. Mabel's face paled, and I thought she might faint. Oh my God, no, she exclaimed. Did you know? I questioned. I knew they were close, but not that close. What will you do? She asked. Let's just say things are going to hit the fan tonight, I remarked. I understand, she said. 
Let me show you something to prepare you, I said, pulling out my smartphone. I played the clip of Bart, Jake, and Kirsten discussing their plan to harm me. Mabel's eyes widened. Oh my God, she gasped. I had no idea. I'm so sorry, Abe. Please forgive me. Not your fault, I assured her. So, what's your plan? I inquired. I've had enough of his lies and abusive behavior. After tonight, I'm ending things with him, she declared. Now, let's go in there and act like everything is fine, shall we? Kirsten was seated at the main table between her father and Jake, while I was assigned a seat at a table facing them. I wasn't pleased with the arrangements, and learning that her father had intentionally separated us made it worse. However, at this point, I didn't really care. Glancing around, I noticed a man in a trench coat and several sheriff's deputies in the hallway outside the room we were using. They managed to slip in before the doors were closed. I surveyed the individuals at my table and couldn't help but observe that none of them would make direct e-contact with me or engage in conversation beyond a courteous acknowledgement of my presence. Even when I looked at Kirsten, she avoided meeting my gaze. I was thoroughly irritated and eagerly awaited the conclusion of the evening. Bart rose from his seat and gently tapped his glass to gather everyone's attention. I'm delighted to see you all here tonight, he exclaimed with a smile. Allow me to introduce our newest team member, Jake Riley. Some of you may already be familiar with Jake, as he worked with us as a contractor eight years ago. Jake will be overseeing our marketing efforts and collaborating closely with all our clients to ensure their needs, as well as our stockholders' interests, are met. This clarified why I hadn't encountered Jake at such events before. Contractors typically weren't invited to company functions like this. Applause filled the room as Jake stood, and I mustered a polite yet subdued clap. Bart continued his announcements. I'd also like to introduce his new personal assistant. Not only is she an outstanding contributor to the company with a sharp business mind, but she also happens to be my daughter, Kirsten Robertson, he mentioned using her maiden name. Apologies, he added. I meant Ryan, Kirsten Ryan. Kirsten stood up, smiling, yet never once casting a glance in my direction. I wished I could disappear under the table, but Bart wasn't done. I've heard it said that personal assistants are often like work spouses, he remarked, looking directly at me. I'm confident that she'll go above and beyond to make Jake's professional life as smooth as possible. Jake embraced her, keeping his arm around her as they faced the audience. Kirsten took a seat, clearly feeling embarrassed. I was torn between the urge to retreat or leap over the table to confront Jake and Kirsten's father. Now, Bart announced, let's enjoy the meal. Everyone eagerly dug into the food, but I could only manage a few bites. I glanced at Kirsten, but she was engrossed in whatever Jake was saying. She looked at me with sad eyes a few times, and I hoped she would stand up and reject the job her father was offering. Unfortunately, she didn't. The others at my table seemed visibly uncomfortable on my behalf. After the meal, as everyone stood to leave, I approached Kirsten, but was intercepted by Jake. He shook my hand, purposefully squeezing it to assert dominance. I returned the grip even stronger, maintaining direct eye contact, and noticed a slight grimace on his face as he let go. So, you must be Kirsten's husband he said with a smirk. Yes, I am, I replied. At least for now. His surprise was evident, and Kirsten recoiled. Don't worry, I'll take very good care of her for you, he said, walking away. Kirsten looked at me questioningly. What was that all about? She asked, clearly displeased. Let's see, your father intentionally separated us, conveniently forgot to use your married name, and that work-wife comment from Jake really annoyed me. I also noticed how friendly you two seemed. I don't appreciate being publicly disrespected like that, so no, I'm not very happy right now, I explained. I'm sorry, she said. I'm sure Daddy didn't mean anything by that. I highly doubt that, I informed her. I'm sorry, she responded. Jake, 
Daddy and I will be tied up in a meeting with some other executives discussing an upcoming trip, so I won't be home for a while. Well, before you head off to your crucial meeting with your work partner, there's someone I'd like you to meet, I said, gesturing towards the man in the trench coat. He approached us, clutching a sizable manila folder. Kirsten Ryan? he queried. Yes, she confirmed. He handed her the envelope. You've been served, he declared, loud enough for everyone around to hear. Kirsten's complexion paled and gasps could be heard from those nearby. She opened the envelope and examined the first page, labeled Petition for Dissolution of Marriage. What is this? she inquired. A divorce, I informed her, citing adultery as the grounds. I've also included DNA test results, confirming that Jake is John's biological father and your father is Kelsey's sperm donor. It turns out Kelsey is your half-sister. Oh, and by the way, Bart happens to be Jake's biological father. I've invoked the prenuptial agreement you signed at your father's insistence, and you'll also notice there's a restraining order mandating that you, your father, or any of your representatives, including Jake, Stay at least 500 feet away from me, the children, my family, or the house. If you need to arrange a time to collect your belongings, contact my attorney. I don't want a divorce, she protested, tears welling up in her eyes. I desire a trustworthy and honest partner, not one who cheats, lies, and schemes. By the way, I recommend you sign those documents promptly. You won't appreciate the consequences if, you choose to contest it. I possess various videos featuring you and Jakey, and I doubt you want that information spreading to everyone you know, I conveyed. Don't concern yourself about the kids. I'll take good care of them for you. What do you mean? She inquired. There are a few more individuals I'd like you to meet, your father and Jake, I remarked, gesturing to the deputies. Bart and Jake approached us before the deputies reached our location. What the hell do you think you're doing, boy? Bart snarled. Screw you, jerk. I'm divorcing Kirsten and handing all of you over to the authorities, I declared. Bart tried to grab my shirt, but a deputy intervened. Bart Robertson, you're under arrest for incest and conspiracy to commit murder, he announced, eliciting audible gasps from others in the room. Two additional deputies apprehended Jake and placed him in handcuffs. Kirsten looked at me with shock in her eyes. Abe, you can't mean all this, she pleaded. I love you. Nonsense, you deceitful woman, I retorted. Two more deputies detained her, reciting her Miranda rights. Bart went into a rage, his eyes bulging. I'm going to kill you, you damn son of a bitch, he screamed as officers dragged him away. A news reporter with a camera was just a few feet away, capturing the entire incident. Mabel approached Bart and delivered a kick to his groin. Too foolish, am I? she yelled. Screw you, jerk. I'll show you foolish. Consider yourself divorced, you disgusting, incestuous piece of garbage. A deputy calmly moved Mabel aside as two others escorted Bart away. The news that evening was certainly worth watching. There has been a significant upheaval in the local business community today, announced a news anchor. Businessman Bart Robertson, accompanied by his daughter and a man identified as his son, was apprehended this evening on charges related to conspiracy for murder and incest during an event meant to unveil the hiring of a new executive. The broadcast then transitioned to footage of the arrest, capturing a visibly angered Bart making threats as deputies attempted to escort him away. The scene unfolded further, with Mabel delivering a kick to his groin. The authorities are currently investigating the allegations, the news anchor reported. The supposed victim of this plot, the husband of Robertson's daughter, informed Eyewitness News that he has initiated divorce proceedings and is seeking custody of their two children, despite DNA evidence indicating he is not the biological father. Stay tuned for further updates. Feeling drained from the evening's unfolding events, I turned off the television and settled into my recliner. The trio of conspirators were detained without bail, as the judge deemed them a potential flight risk. 
the investigation, spanning nearly a month, benefited from a phone system we had established for Robertson's company a few months earlier. This fully digital system recorded all calls, both incoming and outgoing, with a prior warning stating that calls would be recorded for training purposes. Despite Bart's arrogant assumption that his calls wouldn't incriminate him, they ultimately did. Investigators successfully identified the individual Bart had paid for the orchestrated attack against us. Some of the gang members who had received payment decided to cooperate with authorities, providing comprehensive details. The plot also involved an attorney and a superior court judge. While not obligatory, both Mabel and I testified against our respective spouses. The video evidence provided by Sam proved highly beneficial, along with the DNA results I submitted to the district attorney. Additionally, we discovered that Kirsten's inappropriate relationship with her father had started during her high school years, and he was the one who introduced her to Jake. In the end, all three were convicted on all charges and faced lengthy prison sentences. Mabel, as it turned out, was anything but unintelligent. Unbeknownst to me, she held two master's degrees, one in business and another in economics. Additionally, she closely monitored Bart's business affairs and comprehended the intricacies of the operations. In the divorcee, she outmaneuvered Bart, claiming nearly all his assets, including the house and the business, and assumed control. In just six months, she revitalized the company, turning it into a profitable venture. Surprisingly, she also proved to be a loving grandmother to the children. I encountered Kirsten one final time before she began serving her 25-year sentence. I've signed the divorce papers, she declared, pushing the folder toward me. After confirming all the signatures, I questioned her. Why? I inquired. I thought we were deeply in love and planning to spend our lives together. I don't know, she admitted. Dad has always been my first love. I thought I could move past that, but apparently not. But why harm us? Why harm your own children? I pressed. She shrugged. I had hoped you would agree to the terms Dad proposed. When you didn't, I felt I had no other option, she explained. It was foolish, I realize. I'm sorry. Indeed you are, I retorted sarcastically. I know you don't believe me but I truly loved you. Is there anything I can do to make amends for all the pain I've caused you? She pleaded, tears welling up. I glanced at her for the last time. Just one thing, I replied before walking away. Rot in hell.